Got something for you this morning. I hope we're going to have enough. We've got backups. So if you're a dad, stand up. If you're a dad. All right, now I'm going to get Linda. And uh, who else can I get? Joanne? Robin? Oh. If you can uh, hand these out to the dads. Now, don't sit down, men. You're in trouble. Yeah, we're going to do y'all like we did the ladies. I need somebody to run some upstairs. Cindy, you want to run these upstairs? We got... Who did? Robin. Robin went upstairs. Never mind, Cindy. We got it. We're going to talk about dads this morning. All right. Let me know when everybody has one. We're going to have a little fun. We'll play a little game today. Is that everybody? Everybody got one? All right. If you have one child, sit down. Just one. Well, let's do it this way because I know how men are sometimes. If you only have one child, sit down. All right. If you have two children, sit down. How many have three? You got three, sit down. Oh, you might win this. Four. Uh oh, there's, there it is. Five. Oh, you got four? Who's got five? Going once, going twice. You're the dad with the most kids. So let's give him a hand. All right. Stand back up, dads. I love doing this. All right. Stand back up. All right. <laughs> we'll see who the oldest dad is in here. Now, you're going to have to sit down because you've already won. You've already won. All right. If you are uh, 30 and under, sit down. 30 and under, sit down. 40 and under, sit down. 50 and under, sit down. 60 and under, sit down. 65 and under, sit down. 70 and under, sit down. Oh, look at this. All right. 75 and under, sit down. Three-way race. I got to be careful. 78 and younger, sit down. Seven... Skip, oh, we got two. All right, two. 79. Three? three. I didn't see you, EA. 79 in the under, sit down. 80. 81. 82. <laughs> EA. <laughs> yeah. Now, don't everybody stand up for this one. We'll do this one this way. If you are, uh, got it? Got it, all right. Um, if you've been a dad for a year, stand up. Two years, up, oh, a year. A year, you got a year? Two years. Just one year, been dad one year. New dad, two years? Looking for the new dad. Three years. Four? Four, there you go. All right, the youngest one, there you go. There you go, all right. All right. I did something. Uh, I've been, I was crunched for time this week, and just we've had a lot going on. And uh, so what I did is, instead of reading and studying, what I did is I listened to Father's Day sermons. That's right. I was going to try to steal one. <laughs> and I noticed something. They all that I listened to pretty much bash on y'all. What you're not doing, what you need to be doing. You need to be doing more of this. Dad, you need to step up. And I guess men need that step up challenge. So I didn't want to do that this morning. I've noticed there's a pattern uh, every Father's Day. After I have a Father's Day service, I'll have two or three men come up to me and share, you know, that was really good, but that wasn't my dad. And they talked about how they didn't have that type of dad. Being a dad is tough. And I, I heard this. This is a great story. This talks about what tough is. Uh, this is a story about Bill Brown. I do not know who he is. I know he's a football player that played for the Minnesota Vikings. He was all pro fullback. And 
his teammates said he was one of the toughest men they knew. And they were doing an exhibition game at New Orleans. And how many of y'all know what a June bug is? Okay. They were doing an exhibition game at New Orleans. He came off the field. He's soaked in sweat. He's doing everything he can to get win. He, he apparently doesn't have his front teeth. He, he takes his helmet off and puts it on the ground. And he is just sucking air. He's <sighs> and when he did that, a June bug came in and got sucked in. He didn't gag. He didn't cough. He, he just kept going. <sighs> Bugs gone. And so one of his teammates came over to him and says, hey, do you need some water to wash that down? And he said, he looked at, I'm assuming the story is true. He said he looked at his teammate and this is what he said. If he wants down, he can walk down. <laughs> That's tough. And being a dad is tough. You, you, you are providing for your family and you're at a place where you're working and you're dealing with headaches and expectations and, and there's very little appreciation, if any, at work. And then oftentimes when you come home as a dad, you get greeted at the door with the need to be the bad cop. You will not believe what your son did this morning. You need to go. And you have to go be the bad cop. And then after that, you kind of breathe a little bit. No offense, ladies, but they come to us, don't they, men, and say, you know what you forgot to do today? And they tell you. <laughs> and, and then remind you what you need to do. And then sometimes you just feel overwhelmed, alone, and isolated. And then you hear a sermon about how you're not stepping up. It's the truth. Here's a quote from J. August Steinberg. It says, that is the thankless position of a father and a family, the provider of all and the enemy of all. Now, when I say father, there's two camps. Some of you have great memories of your dad. You love your dad. Many of you are missing your dad. He has gone off to to be in eternity, hopefully with the Lord Jesus Christ, but you miss him. And when you think of him, you think of the hugs and the lessons and the fishing trips and the ball games and spending time and playing on the floor. But there's others of you that when I say remember your dad, you remember the yelling and the stumbling around as he was drunk, what he did to your mom, and what he said to you. And some of those don't even talk to their dad anymore. And so there's two camps, and, and most camps come to church every Father's Day. And so what I want to do is to talk about not just remembering dad, but to challenge the new dads. Because when, when we remember dad, hopefully, what some of us remember, I shouldn't say hopefully, what some of us remember is our dad was a great teacher. He took time to show us things and invest in us, things that you still do today the way he showed you, whether that was how to shave, drink coffee, how to make coffee. He took some time with you, and he was a great teacher. But some of us had absent dads. And listen, they didn't mean ill will by that. They just didn't either have a role model or they didn't know what to do. They were working so hard to provide for the family. They just weren't there. And, and I had one of those dads. My dad is a great dad. He did everything he could to provide for us. But he was an accountant. He was studying for a CPA exam. He was doing all these things. And a lot of times he just wasn't there. Not because he couldn't, or I shouldn't say not that he didn't want to be. He just couldn't be. And so a lot of my life I had to guess at how to do stuff. I remember I broke down with my girlfriend in our car one day and I popped the hood open and just tried to look like I knew what I was doing. I had a clue. I couldn't tell you what a distributor cap was because he was at, I had to guess. And so I got back in the car. I'll never forget it. She says, what's wrong? I said, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. And, but I didn't know. And, and so, you know, that causes some hurts with us. Some of our dads were encouragers. They would cheer us on. Uh, I like watching, you're going to laugh at me, I like watching the YouTube stuff that makes me happy cry. I watch it all day long. And I saw one where this, this boy was getting up to sing. It was America's Got Talent, Britain. He was getting ready to sing. He was talking about his dad and his parents and their investment in his life. And his dad works security for the oil rigs. I don't know how that works, but he's a security. So he's gone most of the year. 
and he gets up there and he's talking about his parents and his dad and and Simon said something about which one do you which one loves you the most which one's your encourager he said my dad and this voice came out of the back and said yes I am <laughs> and his son didn't know he was there and he looked over and he said my dad has never missed me singing and he's here tonight he had come in just for that. That's an encourager. Some of our dads were discouragers. You could get four A's and a B, and what you would hear is, I'm so sad you got that B, son. Well, you did everything right in the game, but you fumbled in the fourth quarter. And you hear, I can't believe you did that. But, Dad, I got four touchdowns. I don't care. It reflects bad on us. And they were discouragers. We had some dads that were life givers. They just poured their life into us. And they said, I love you and I'm proud of you. And there's others that were life stealers. They never gave us any of that. And many of the kids that grew up with those bad dads are angry. They're hurt. Matter of fact, they've done some studies. And they said many adults that have dads that aren't good usually are workaholics because they know they're not good enough, and they're hoping their, their dad will notice and be proud of them. They're seeking affirmation they never got. Let me read you something from uh, one of my heroes from the cinema. And I'm going to give you the name at the end of this. This is what he said. Some of y'all probably heard this. My dad was the chief police, and whenever he came into the room, the light and all the air went out of it. There's a saying in the South that no man is a man until his father tells him he is, and it means that someday when you're 30 or 40 grown up, this man whom you respect and love and who you want to love, you hope will put his arms around you and say, you know, you're a man now. You don't have to do all those crazy things you're doing to get getting into fist fights and all that to defend your honor. You don't have to prove anything to me. You're a man. I love you. But with my dad and me, we never hugged, we never kissed, and we never said, I love you. No, we never cried together. So what happened was later I was desperately looking for someone who would say, you're grown up now. I approve of you. I love you. You don't have to do these things anymore, but that didn't happen. And I was lost inside, and for most of my life, I couldn't connect. I was incomplete, and I didn't know then what I needed to know now. That was Burt Reynolds. And he was able to look back at his life and say, you know, the reason I did all this, this attention seeking that I was doing was I just needed my dad to say, I'm proud of you. I love you. And so dads, what I'm going to do is to give you a foundation to build on. I had a great dad, but my dad dropped the ball. My kids had a great dad. I got a great text from my daughter today. It made me tear up. But I dropped the ball a lot with them. If you ask them, and you can ask them, they'll go, oh, yeah, let me tell you how you dropped the ball. None of us are what? Perfect. None of us are perfect. And what all of us need to realize is, is often the fathers that hurt us, they didn't wake up one morning and say, what can I do to hurt my kids? They were only given the tools they had, and they probably didn't get that from their parents. And they were probably trying to do the best they could and didn't know how to do it better. And so I want to give you a foundation to the new dads, the dads with teenagers, granddads. All of us can use this, and I'm, and I'm going to put it around time. I went to go see Shelby and Dean Brooks and uh, their son and, and their mother this week, and the church sign had time on it. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen these signs where they're, they're flipping through. Well, I saw time, and I looked in the rearview mirror waiting for it to switch to see what it was talking about. It never did. So on the way home, I sat there and waited. <laughs> and it said, how do children spell love? T-I-M-E. And I thought about that this week. How can we be better fathers or grandfathers? And listen, some of y'all are fathers and you don't even have kids. I, I spent the, uh, was it Friday night, talking to a bunch of young boys who had somebody they referred to as uncle. He was a dad to those boys. He would leave work and on the way home go 30 minutes out of his way 
to spend 15 to 20 minutes with one of those little boys. They're men now. And you know who they say shaped their life? Him. He took time. And two of them were heading down to, I think it was North Carolina, to go spear some flounder. And they had their boat and their truck. And I said, who's going with you? It's us. And I thought, how old are y'all? 16 to 17? And I thought, these are two men that are ready for the world. They're going to go down there and do that all by their what? They ain't got mama calling nobody going, can you set up a hotel room for? They're handling it. They've manned up because a man took what? Time. So men and women, this will be on the app later. The notes will be on the app later if the internet at our place works. Um, and uh, also, if you need the notes, you just text me and I'll, I'll send them to you because I, I feel it's that important. So number one is just time together. If you want to be a dad that, that is there, it takes time together. Time is what builds memories and time is what helps connect you to each other. The book famous says, two cannot walk together unless they agree. And listen, you can't agree with anybody unless you're spending time and talking and understanding and getting to know. And, and what that does, it steadies your child so they're not drifting. Especially if life throws them a curveball, they can handle it because they're steadied because they've had time with dad. And what I mean by time is not like, I'm going to give you 20 minutes, let's play Xbox. That's time too. I'm talking about where you're doing something with them. I never had little kids, so I'm kind of living vicariously through my grandchild. And me and Mia went squirrel stalking the other day. <laughs> She had squirrels, and, and I held her in my arm. She's four years old, and, and I said, let's see how close we can get. And she goes, why do you want to do that? Just to see if we can do it, honey. So, and I told her, I said, she, and you know how the little kids are. Why is he doing that? Shh, got to be quiet when you're stalking a squirrel. Okay, why is he doing that? I don't know, shh. Why are you standing still? If they see you moving, they're going to run. Oh, okay. How close are you going to get? We're going to get as close as we can get. Will he get me? No, he's not going to get you. And, and we, got, we did it two times, and she got excited. She can, can I do the next one myself? I said, you sure can, sweetie. So she was so cute. She, she, she was doing this. She walked just like this. <laughs> and every now and then, she would turn around to me and go, and she walked, well, the squirrel went behind the tree. And I told her, you get the squirrel behind the tree, you can really get up on it quick. So she got right up to the tree. And then she turned around. If you've seen Mia run, she runs fast. She bolted from the tree and ran to me. And I said, sweetie, you almost had it. She said, I'm scared he's going to get me. <laughs> now, why do I tell that story? Because the next day she said what? Let's do it again. And it's, that's how you're... Did I connect with her? Did she connect with me? You've got to take time. You've got to make it happen. You've got to make some appointments. I did a horrible job of that as a dad. That's where I dropped the ball right there. Number one, time together. Number two, impart life skills. I'm going to share this with you. And I don't want you ever thinking I'm talking bad about my dad. I love my dad. But he just didn't teach me a lot of life skills. And I'm going to tell you what life skills are, and you're going to laugh at me. Laura Tigner was the one that taught me how to drink soda out of a bottle. I would wrap my lips right around the whole thing and drink it. And she looked at me and said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? She goes, you drink it like this. And we sat in the back of a station wagon on the way on a field trip somewhere, and she showed me how to properly drink out of a bottle. And I said, that works a whole lot better. That is a life skill. Uh, no, it was fresh bottle, buddy. That was mine. We had stopped up at Watts and we had gotten it. Um, listen, when that stuff happens in life, how did I feel at that moment? I felt bad. So I'm guessing at life. I don't have anybody showing me how to do it. That's why I popped the hood on the car and said it's bad. No life skills. My dad did teach me to drive on the stick shift. He did teach me to drive on the interstate. He, he, he worked with me on homework every night. That never sunk in for whatever reason. But you know who taught me how to shave with a razor? Frank Schultz, police officer. My dad had an electric razor, and 
he used that and that's what I used. I used his old one and then we went on a trip somewhere and I didn't have my electric razor and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm messed up. He said, you need to shave with a, with a blade. Well, I ain't doing that. I'll cut you. And he sat in that bathroom with me and walked me through everything. How to pull it tight. How to come in sideways. And he taught, I use that every day. You know who taught me tie tie? Granddaddy. Granddaddy Hale taught me how to tie tie. And he was tough on me. Here's how you make the knot. Here's how you do it. This is not, do it. That's ugly. Do it again. That's not even. Do it again. Straighten it up. But you know what I learned to do? Tie tie. Listen. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And people quote that verse talking about instilling Christianity in them. That's not what this verse is even about. It's about every child's been a certain way. Every child is, has a way about it. And if you will teach him these things, he will not depart from it. If you teach him how to work and make a dollar, guess what? When he gets older, he's what? He'll do it. And, and so some of the life skills that I use every day, listen, I, it amazes me, and I'm not busting on you if you're one of these parents. I'm just saying I'm going to shake you a little bit and say, wake up. I'm amazed that there are kids in school and mama is still doing stuff for them. When I say school, I'm saying college. Are you up? Let me buy some groceries for you. Let me get this. Let me do, let them grow up. But they'll miss work. Good, life lesson learned. But see, they should have learned these lessons when? Way back here. Teach them some life lessons. I'm going to give you some that, that I try to teach my kids. I try to teach the girls the difference between a boy and a man. What to look for. How he should treat you. Now, if they listen to that, that's on who? It's on them. But at least I, I taught them. I taught Michelle and them how to change a, a tire where the oil stick was and all these things. But you know what? They, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the things they picked up was the things I modeled for them. So next second one is impart life skills, but it ties into the next point, which is master the big picture. Let me show you this verse. This is from Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. 19. It says, you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land. Don't we want our days to be multiplied and our children to be multiplied? <laughs> Not to be cut short. Of which the Lord swore to the fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. What I mean by mastering the, the big picture is giving your children a philosophy of life, and you do that with them. So one of the things... You get what you get what you give. There's another one too that I know. If you if my girls are shopping, you get what you pay for. And I had a lot of these little sayings I did. And it shocked me because I was out with Nikki. She's home from school and we were out the other night and she was listening to music. And she said, Do you remember you showed me the song? You remember the song? And it was uh, Minute Work, Overkill. Or I forgot what the next, yeah, I think it was overkill. And I was like, oh my gosh. When did I show you that? You were in the office. We were listening to all that 80s music. Do you remember? Guess what she listens to? I ruined her. <laughs> I ruined her. Um, but what I was doing was giving her a philosophy of life. And, and when the car broke down and the tire was flat, I didn't get out and fix it. I said, Michelle, guess what? We're going to learn how to change a tire today. Let's go out here and do it. And my back went out that day. I fell down on the pavement screaming and crying. It was one of the two times my kids saw me cry. And you know who changed the tire? Who changed it? Michelle. Michelle. I talked her through it, laying on the paper. <laughs> she learned a life skill. And she talks about that. That was the day my dad taught me. Listen, we teach our kids all kinds of things like this. We either teach them, if life is hard, blame someone else for it. You're shaping their big picture. Or you could do this. Life is hard, don't let it break you. You could do this. When life's unfair, cry and stomp your feet and sue someone. Listen, some of y'all teach that to them unknowingly. Or you could teach them this. When, it's, when the unfair things happen, rise up and overcome it. Beat them at it. You, some of us teach this. You have a right to fill in the blank. 
You have a right to be happy. If you can't be happy, fooey on them. You, you teach those, listen, they're going to learn sooner or later, life isn't about being what? Amen. And we could teach them this, nothing is given to you, you need to work for it. I wonder if we're teaching them this, when you die, this is what happens. This is what life is really about. This is why Jesus Christ came. This is why we go to church. Give them a master big picture of their life. A quote I want to read to you. I believe that what we become depends on what our fathers teach us at odd moments when they weren't trying to teach us. We are formed by little scraps of wisdom each day. And so as we walk and as we talk and as we sit, I do that with Mia and I do that with my girls. I did that. I'm having this with Michelle this week. Michelle did a stupid thing. She just made a, it wasn't a bad choice. It was just a reaction. She reacted to something and somebody else reacted to something. It was all this. I know this is going to shock you being in Tappahannock and I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you this as a pastor. It was drama. <laughs> And she texted me and, and she said, you know, it is so hard being an adult. I said, it is, but you need some tools. Can I talk to you next week? You know, we've already got that on the calendar. And I'm going to sit down and talk to her and say, I'm not going to say this is how you should do it. This is what I'm going to say. You know what you did? Let me tell you how I did it. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. But one day I said, this needs to change. And this is how it can change. Do you want to change, sweetie? And of course she's going to say, Linda. Let me give you some advice. That's helping her get a master big picture, a philosophy of life. The last one is this. Engrave personal convictions and values into your kids. Let me read you this verse from Thessalonians. It says, you are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. And as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children. I'm going to read you this quote. You will leave in your children what you live out at home. You will. The best way of training a young person is to train yourself the same way. Amen. Not to admonish them, but to be seen never doing that of which you would admonish them. Plato said that back in Greece. Been around forever. We say this, don't we? Do as I say, not as I. Your kids are going to do what you say or not. They're going to look at you, and they're going to do exactly what you do. I had a mom call me this week and say, you know, there's some parts of my daughter I am so glad she got from me. It makes me so happy. And there's other parts she got from me. Oh, my. We all have that, amen? And it's just not what we say. It is what we do. It's called, that's called modeling. That's called integrity. And so I was, I don't know if Stephanie's here. Where is Stephanie here? You know, I, I told you I really liked that guy that we were sat. There was, there was a young man I talked to. I just loved him. You know why? What you see is what you. I love that. I strive for that. I'm not good at that. I struggle with that too. But that's integrity that your words and your example line up. And that's how we integrate into our kids. And so that spells time. And I hope, men, that you will just look at those things and say, I'm going to start getting intentional about this. I want to read you this, and then we'll close. We're going to get out early today. See, miracles still do happen. <laughs> see, if you will do those four things, your children will see your heart. And, Dad, every one of us need to say three things to our kids. I love you. I'm proud of you. And you're good at, and then fill in the blank. No. Michelle's really good with people. She's not where she needs to be yet, but she's, she's getting there. Nikki is really good, like her mama. She's got a BS degree. And I don't mean Bachelor of Science. <laughs> what I mean by that, and it is a compliment, that was a joke at our house. She is very diplomatic. Nikki, I am so thankful she got this from her mama. She can tell you the truth with some diplomacy, and that is powerful. 
She also can shoot from the hip and let the chips fall. I don't like that side of her, but she can do that too. But if Nikki needs to be in the moment and be diplomatic and do it in a way that communicates and connects, she's got it. And it was modeled, it wasn't taught. Michelle is more, <laughs> Nikki is more, but they both girls know our hearts. And when I say, men, you need to say this, God did this for his son. In Matthew 17, 5, this is what he said. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came from the cloud, saying, this is my beloved son. I what? I love you. In whom I'm well pleased, I'm proud of you. Please hear him, because he's good. I'm going to read you this letter to let you know how important it is, Dad, to say those things and how this all ties in with God. It says, My father was killed in World War II when I was three years old, and I knew in my heart that he loved me. My mother told me that he loved me, but I had always longed to hear it for myself from him. When my mother and stepfather retired and left Alaska, I came over one day to help them pack, and Mom took out an old Army photograph of my father in his army uniform. <clears throat> I took the picture off of the dresser. I'm sorry, she took the picture off the dresser and gave it to me and she said, here, this is for you. I know your father would wanted you to have it. This is the same photo I had seen for so many years. As I took the picture from her, it dropped and the cheap metal frame hit the floor and broke and it shattered the glass. Sick at heart, I reached down to salvage what was left. And behind the photograph, I found a letter. It had been placed there 37 years before and had long since been forgotten. It was a letter, letter from my father to his three-year-old son. <coughs> the last letter he'd written before he had died. In it, he said that he loved me. And he longed to come home and be with me. I'd heard the words I needed to hear from my father, who was long since dead. That's what every child needs from their dad. And listen, children, that's what every dad needs from their children. I love you. I'm proud of you. And dad, you were good at. The reason I say this reminds me of God is because God so loved you that he gave everything he had, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God so loves you, he seeks that none should perish. And listen, the Bible is very clear. God draws all men to himself, all of them. But some will reject him and some will accept him. You know, and if you accept God on Father's Day, or if you're a child of God, let me share something with you. God desires that you spend time with him to connect with him, that he can impart life to you, that he can give you the master big picture for your life because he knows the plans he has for you, and to engrave convictions to live by that will help guide you the rest of your life. He is our heavenly father and our father example. And he loves you more than you know. And so on this Father's Day, I hope you will do three things. Number one, you'll take what I said, take it to heart and live it. Take time. Number two, that you as children would tell your dad, I love you, I'm proud of you, and you're good at. Some of our fathers weren't good at, but they need to hear a little bit. But dads, I hope on Father's Day when your kids text you or call you, you will figure out what you need to tell them. And I hope it is, I want you to know I love you, I am proud of you, and you're good at. Because that's what God does for us each and every day. Amen? Let's pray. Father, there's some here that they have issue with even calling you Father. It was so bad for them. I pray that they see that you're not the absent Father, that you're the encourager, the life giver the one who's the teacher, 
so that we don't have to guess at life. Father, you're the one who's laid down everything to restore that which was broken. And so, Father, I pray that you would heal the men that are hurting, the women that are hurting because of, because of things that just took place. Father, there's some of us that when we think of Dad, we tear up because he was so great and he was so good. And we rise up and call him blessed. And some of us are missing him because he's gone. I pray that you would heal them and comfort them, but help all of us to be that type of dad. Help us to take time every day to connect, make memories. Help us to impart life skills to our children. Father, that you would help us to get a master picture for our kids that is in, is in line with your word and that we would engrave biblical convictions and values in their life, that they would live long in the land. Help us to celebrate dads. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. Our hymn of commitment and invitation this morning's hymn.